Well, good evening. Welcome you again, and we invite you to, as we open our hymnals to turn number 456, and we'll stand as we sing, I Belong to the King. Did you know something I did different tonight? I did not I did not wave my hand. You were looking at your book anyhow, so you wouldn't have seen it anyhow, right? All right, anyhow, let's go ahead and sing verses two and three. I belong to the king, and he loves me, I know, for his mercy and kindness. Wherever I go, and my refuge unfailing is he. I belong to the king, I'm a child of his love, and he never forsaketh his own. He will call me someday to his palace above. Let's go ahead and have prayer this evening. Roger, would you please lead us? You may be seated, and 454 is our next hymn. And we'll go ahead and sing verses 1 and 3. Sway. I 
sing that last verse, I know somewhere in my Bible I have written, if I have Jesus, I have everything. Now, we could also say, besides if we have Jesus, we have everything. If we don't have Jesus, what do we have? What do we have? Nothing. Nothing. All right. Who's famous for singing this song? George Beverly Shea. Okay. Wrote the music down here, and uh, so he did sing it a lot, of course. Verse number three, let's sing that one. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out the comb. He's all that my hunger spirit needs. I'd rather be his and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than Would you at this time take your prayer sheet?
Okay, just some reminders of our announcements uh, going on this week. Wednesday, our regular programs for adults, teenagers, and children at 7 o'clock. And just a reminder to the church officers, our brief board meeting after the Wednesday night service, that'll be around 8.30, just meet briefly. And then on Saturday, our adult volleyball activity at 6.30 in the gymnasium. And then next Sunday, we're going to have our afternoon service. So please remember when you come, if you're going to stay for the noon meal, please bring a main dish and either a side dish or dessert to share. And then the service will be at 1 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Uh, you can either go home after Sunday school and come back, or if you just want to stay, just bring some food and share that. Uh, we'll just have a great time together, a great time of fellowship together, and a chance for you to get to meet uh, Luke and Vivian Magner, as they'll be with us next week as well. So just a great uh, schedule ahead. So some different things, the church directory on the back uh, bulletin board. Hopefully it, looks, it looks like a lot of families took time to check off and make sure their information was correct. If you did not get a chance to do that, please go ahead and do that. And as I mentioned this morning, if you are a church member, there are copies of the church budget on the back table back there. So please pick up a copy and look that over in preparation for it our um, membership meeting two weeks from today. Okay, those are our announcements. Uh, please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Jeremiah tonight, the book of Jeremiah and chapter number nine. Jeremiah chapter number nine is where we're going to be at here this evening. Sometimes schools have a show and tell where they ask the students, bring in something that's uh, important to you or something maybe perhaps that you had created, maybe a craft item, maybe some kind of a trophy that uh, you worked hard to earn, or maybe perhaps something that has sentimental value in your family. And so sometimes schools will offer and extend to the students a show and tell, show us the object and then tell us why this is important to you. And a lot of those can be really enjoyable. It tells you a lot about that person and what they've accomplished or what's important to you. I always enjoy, if there is an enjoyable part of it, a funeral service when hearing about the favorite hobbies and maybe accomplishments of the deceased and things that they were interested in. It kind of gives that personal touch like, wow, this person really enjoyed this particular sport or this particular hobby or maybe they had some other great accomplishments. And it's always nice to be able to share these facts in remembrance of the loved one that had passed away. It's wonderful that God allows us as individuals to enjoy skills and accomplishments because God really wants you to enjoy life. There's some people who wouldn't agree with that. They think God just kind of puts you on earth and says, here, just survive bread and water, prisoner, you know, and I hope you just get by. God wants us to enjoy life. That's not the purpose of my life, but he does want to give us life and life more abundantly. Yes. So God allows us to have some skills and maybe your skills are different from somebody else's skills and maybe perhaps things that you can do that other people can't do. And maybe you've, uh, maybe you've accomplished some great things in your life and God gives that to us. Now it's not sinful to enjoy life and to enjoy different skills that God has given to us unless that activity becomes our life goal and our identity instead of God. So we enjoy these skills and we look at these accomplishments, but we don't look at that, that defines me. And there's a fine line there. God has given us various skills for our enjoyment and also for his glory because he's deserving of glory. When people only emphasize their skill and their accomplishments, and they ignore God, that skill or accomplishment then becomes an idol. And we need to be careful in that, that, you know, that doesn't define who I am. I can enjoy this hobby, this sport, this uh, skill, this trade, or whatever it may be. I can enjoy that. But if that defines who I am, that can certainly become an idol in my life. Let me just give you a little bit of background, and you're going to think, how does this all fit together here? Trust me, I hope I can bring it all together here. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is preaching to the nation of Judah. The northern nation of Israel had already been taken captive by the Assyrians. They've already been sent, killed, some taken into captivity. Judah, the southern nation, is now going to be attacked by Babylon. And, they, and Jeremiah is preaching to them to repent, repent, come back to God, and the, the judgment is coming soon. What's really hard to comprehend is even when Jeremiah warns them of coming judgment, 
And the false prophets are saying, peace, peace, there's going to be peace. And people looked out the walls of Jerusalem and saw the Babylonian army all around them. Guess who they believed? The false prophets. Now you're surrounded by the enemy. And you're told that they're, uh, Jeremiah is saying, they're going to kill you. You say, oh, no, these prophets said peace. They're just here to congratulate us. <laughs> So Jeremiah is warning the nation of Judah to repent, repent. The end is near. God's going to use the Babylonian army to judge you. Some are going to be killed. Many are going to be killed. Some are going to be taken captive. It's time to realize what are you living for? God's judgment is coming. Let's understand the background here. Look at Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 20. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth, and teach your daughters wailing, and every one her neighbor lamentation. For death is come up into our windows, and is entered into our palaces, to cut off the children from without, and the young men from the streets. Speak, thus saith the Lord, even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon your open field, and as a handful after the harvestmen, and none shall gather them." Look at verse 25. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the uttermost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in their heart. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. And this is just a few verses in Jeremiah 9. God's warning them, the end is near. Destruction's about to come upon you. And right in between the verses that we read, we get this moment of clarity, if you will. This moment when they're being challenged, what skills will you have that will save you and redeem you from the enemy? What resources do you have? Because they had already forsaken the God of Israel. So what do you got left of your own? And it boils down to uh, Jeremiah is going to challenge them. The end is near. What have you been living for? Powerful question. The end is near. What have you been living for? Years ago, Tombstone Pizza had a uh, little slogan in saying, what do you want on your tombstone? Now, of course, they're asking pepperonis, anchovies, extra cheese, okay? But do you think about it? Some people do a play on that. What do you want written on your tombstone? Sometimes people, many uh, years ago, especially a century or more ago, sometimes people would put a little summary statement of that person's life. What are you living for? Uh, one preacher not too many years ago said, what fills in your dash? In other words, on your tombstone, it has the year that you were born and the year that you died. And in between the year you were born and the year you died, there's a dash mark. What fills in your dash? What are you living for? The end is near. So how, what is your life going to be summarized in? What is your identity in? Where do you find your identity? What's your purpose in life? Well, Jeremiah is going to challenge us here through inspiration. So let's notice verse number 23 that's tucked in between the verses that we just read. And in verse 23, we're going to see, first of all, other sources of glory. Verse 23 Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. Three different categories here that we are challenged to not glory in these particular events, not let them define who I am. Now, it's not saying that these three categories are wrong in and of themselves, but if I'm to glory in them, to boast in them, to brag about them, to say that this defines me, then there's really a problem. Satan wants to offer many substitutes, as he often does in life. You know, to some, when, he gets, when he tempts us to sin, to this particular person, maybe he'll offer this, this, and this sin, because that, that appeals to them. But there may be somebody else like, nah, these things aren't really appealing. So he offers this, this, and this. And so he knows what appeals to us and what will feed our pride and what will lure us to go away from God. So Satan has many different substitutes. It's not the same thing. And really, frankly, he doesn't care what it is as long as it takes us away from God. 
If we were to glory in something, we're to make a show or to boast about something. And it could be either privately in my own heart, I'm the best. You know, I can do this. I can handle this. This is not a problem. I'm really good at this. Privately in our hearts or even publicly as we would speak out and brag and boast and and talk about ourselves. What are you living for? When the end is near, what were you living for? I'd just like to read two different quotes that I got from a book that I own called Gospel Treason, written by Brad Bigney. And they are powerful quotes, and so I'd like to share them with you. And he writes, and he says, Living for God's glory uh, slips into living for your own glory. If you're not careful, it'll slide into that. And, And he writes, If you live for the praise, the recognition, the attaboys, you've crossed the line from working for the glory of God to idolatry and it will ensnare you. You know that God is loving, that he's gracious, he's merciful, he's kind, he's patient, but he's also jealous. And he will come and upset that little apple cart of yours if he sees that you no longer are working excellently for the glory of God, but for the glory of self. He continues on and says, idolatry changes how you see yourself. So here's this process here. I'm now doing it for myself. I made myself an idol, and now it will change how I think. And he continues, and he says, when you are snared into the trap of idolatry, you take on an an entirely different identity. You start redefining yourself in light of that particular idol. Now, not only do you live for your marriage or your kids, You so define yourself by your idol that you become your marriage or your kids. That's why when one of those things you live for is threatened, you react so fiercely and violently. You are struck with panic if that it's taken away or if someone gets in the way of that thing because it's not just a thing or person you enjoy, it's who you are. There's a loss of self that is being threatened. You're afraid that you are going to lose yourself. And so we realize, yes, God can give you skills and abilities and talents, but if that is where you find your identity, your purpose for life, why you are here, then when that thing is being threatened, it's like you yourself, your existence and your purpose is being threatened rather than the glory of God. So let's look at these three categories mentioned in verse number 23. He mentions in the first one, he says, Thus saith the Lord, verse 23, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Now, to have wisdom is a good thing. Don't you wish our society was full of a lot more wise people? (sighs) I sure do. That would be great. Society would be so much more enjoyable and functional if we had a lot of people using great wisdom. So the wisdom itself is not evil. Wisdom is a good thing. And for you and I to have wisdom is a good thing. It provides, it adds enrichment to our lives to have wisdom, to know how to use things. It gives us safety, knowing that, hey, I ought not to do that. That can result in danger. I have wisdom. It gives us efficiency, how to make this job function better and faster. And so wisdom is a good thing. It really enriches our lives. Knowing how to fix a vehicle when it's broken. Hey, that's a good thing. It, it helps you know, save money. It helps us get to where we need to go. This is a good, to know how to prepare a meal, uh, to be able to put the, get together the ingredients, how to cook it, how to prepare it, how to serve it. This is a good thing to have this wisdom. Wisdom is even an important part of American history. Our early forefathers saw the importance of an education And they declared that the United States government would provide free public education for its its citizens. That was pretty novel at the time. Before then, everybody, you'd have to hire your own tutor. And only the rich could afford that. But the forefathers of our country said, we want to provide a free public education for all children to be able to have the foundation. Okay, knowledge and education is very important. It's a good thing to have. But if you and I glory in it, if we find that as our identity, this is who I am, this is what I glory in, then it soon becomes sinful. Only the fool would be able to say, well, wisdom is who I am. 
I'm wiser and smarter than others. Listen as I read Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 21. Isaiah preaching to the same people, warning the same nation of Judah. And he says in Isaiah 5, 21, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Hey, to have wisdom is a good thing, but if that's going to define who you are, you're the most educated person, or you know this and that, you know more than anybody else. If we're going to glory in that, then that has become an idol in our lives, and that will not save us in the day of trouble. When we glory in something, we often talk about it and often remind people of it. We often think of it privately, and we often share it publicly. Now, it's great to have a lot of knowledge. It's great to have wisdom to apply that knowledge. It's great when you have contact people like, hey, I got this problem with my vehicle, with uh, this appliance, or maybe how to make this or how to do this craft, and maybe you know people you can ask for advice from. That's great. That's, that's kind of all helping each other out. But if we turn that to that is who I am and that is what I glory in, our education, our knowledge, our our mental skills, yeah, it's great to be a computer whiz, a great baker, or to have a lot of college education. But we're here for the glory of God, not for the glory of self. Keep a marker here in Jeremiah 9. Please turn to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to see almost these same categories mentioned again in 1 Corinthians. The same God, the same emphasis, the same message. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul the Apostle, under inspiration, writing to the church at Corinth, who had a multitude of spiritual problems. They were all divisive. They were all in their own uh, groups. They had their own cliques. They were all looking out for self. And so they had a lot of these same sinful characteristics that defined who they were. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning of verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things that are despised. So we would say not riches, the opposite of riches, same three categories. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Verse 31 is a a quote from Jeremiah 9, 24. And it's interesting that he would mention Paul the Apostle being familiar with the Scriptures, the wise men, the mighty, and those that have things that are uh, pleasurable, uh, maybe the riches, are being debased and despised, the same three categories that he's mentioning. And he's saying that we're not to glory in them, but if any man's to glory, let him glory in the Lord. Now, if God's going to confound the wise, the mighty, the noble, as was mentioned earlier in 1 Corinthians 3, To confound means to put the shame. God's going to have to say, nah, you're going to build yourself up like that? I'm going to have to put you down. It's not right. I love you too much. It's not right. You have idols in your life. And when you have idols in your life, I can't bless you like I want to. I'm going to have to judge you. And I don't want to do that. I want to have to bring you down. We see that we are... Other sources of glory is wisdom, but turn back to Jeremiah chapter 9, and verse 23 again. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, bragging about their education and all these things they can do. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. So we would think this as strength, hard work, that maybe you're diligent and very hard work. And you know what? That in and of itself is a great thing. Don't you wish more people in our society today worked hard? Or I should say, that worked? (laughs) Wow! Strength and work and diligence is a great thing. It's a great characteristic. It's a Christian quality. God condemns laziness, so when we work, that is a good thing, okay? But if I'm going to take that good thing and glory in it and boast and brag about it, and let it define who I am, then it has become an idol in my life, and I'm not glorying in the Lord. 
Listen as I read Jeremiah 17 in verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. A hardworking attitude is a great thing. I wish many more had it. But God is warning us to not find our identity in our diligence or our hard work. Was there anybody in the Bible that gloried in their strength and found defeat? I thought of the Philistine giant Goliath. Do you remember when he was on the battlefield and there he is bragging before Saul's army, send a man and, you know, and if he defeats me, then all these other Philistines will become your servants, which, by the way, did they when Goliath was defeated? No, they ran. They said, we're not part of that deal. And so here is Goliath, a man, a man of war from his youth. Saul even recognized that. And he looked at David and said, you're but a youth. But David was not glorying in his strength. I believe he gave the example of the lion and the bear, not to glory in him, but to tell Saul, give me a chance. Don't count me out. And when David comes to, in the battlefield with Goliath, he says, you come to me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Goliath, who gloried in his strength, found death. David, who came in the name of the Lord, found victory. We're not to glory, define ourselves in, in our wisdom, in our strength, but look again at verse 23 of Jeremiah 9. The last part of that verse, let not the rich man glory in his riches. Now, to, to have riches, to have good financial discipline, again, is a great thing. Now, sometimes riches are gained by inheritance or maybe unexpected sources, but some, a lot of times riches are gained by good hard work, good financial discipline, good decision-making, and, and this is a good thing. It's a blessing. God oftentimes will use riches as one of his means to bless his children, okay? So for somebody to be rich doesn't mean that they're evil and cursed, okay? So it could be blessings, and this is good, hard work and diligence. And listen, financial discipline is a wonderful quality trait to have. The opposite of that would be impulsive buying, where you see something I wanted, I, don't, I can't afford it, but I'll get it anyway. That's terrible. That's impulsive. But to have financial discipline, I'll wait, I'll save up for it, I'll pray for it, and different things like that. That is great. That's very novel. But if I allow that financial discipline in my life to become, to define who I am and find my confidence in that, it has become an idol and it has replaced God on the throne of my heart. And it's wrong at that point. Sometimes when others face financial needs, if they are trusting in their riches, when a financial need comes to them, instead of going to prayer, they go to the bank, the financial institution bank. Instead of praying about it, trusting in just our riches, glorying in our financial skills. By the way, are you convinced that you're the best deal finder? <laughs> I can find those deals. And you know, it's, uh, once again, here's Satan. He tries to convince all of us that we can find these deals. And some people have a knack for it. They really can, okay? And they have maybe the spiritual gift of a giver, and then God's allowed them to find that. But somehow along the way, Satan always tries to convince us that, like, we're better than others. You know, we can find the best deal, the best product, the best price. Uh, we found it when no one else could. And so, therefore, we can, if we're not careful, wind up glorying in our riches or our financial skills. If you keep a marker here in Jeremiah, turn to 1 Timothy, if you will, in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul the Apostle will warn us against this glorying in our riches. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 17 in just a minute. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Charge them, God through Paul the apostle, to Timothy, Pastor Timothy, to preach to the church of Ephesus, says in verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. What's interesting in verse 17, he's not condemning the riches. 
He's not telling Tim, Pastor Timothy, hey, you need to tell all the people in your congregation, give up all their money. He's not saying that at all. He's not saying your riches are evil or sinful. It's not money that is the root of all evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. That's also mentioned here in, this, in verse number 10. And he's charging them that are rich that, number one, they be not high-minded. Don't think yourself better than others. And number two in verse 17, that they trust not in uncertain riches. So don't be high-minded. Don't trust in just your riches. But what you ought to do, look at verse 17, is in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So though you have those riches, they're not defining who I am. Who I am is defined that my relationship with God, not my riches. Listen as I read. Uh, you want to keep a marker there in 1 Timothy. We're coming back to that general neighborhood later on. Not first thing, but that general neighborhood. Save you some page turning. But listen as I read from Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 28. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous man shall flourish as a branch. So there's that having riches or trusting just in riches. If the economy turns very poor, which it will, if you look at uh, financial statistics, our economy is on the verge of imploding. When you explode, things blow out. Imploding means they collapse from within. That's a different sermon all the way together, okay? But if you look at an economy and it begins to implode, if the rich say, well, I'll be able to survive. I'll weather out the storm. And you know what? It's great to diversify our investments and to have different things. I get that. And we ought to be wise managers of God's resources. Yes, we ought to. But if that has become my trust, and instead of trusting God, I'm depending upon my resources, my riches, and I'm not trusting in God, there's an idol that has formed in my life. Job even recognized this. Job, a man who was extremely wealthy and rich before everything had collapsed on him, and he goes and he, re and he realizes, hey, I wasn't trusting in my riches before anyway. I was trusting in God. And he makes a statement in Job chapter 31, two different verses. Job says, if I have made gold my hope and, sa and have said to the fine gold, thou art my confidence, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge. For I should have denied the God that is above. When Job's friends were accusing him, yeah, see, God's punishing you, trusting your riches. I wasn't trusting in my riches. That's sinful. That's wrong. And if I did, then I would have rightly been judged by God. Even Job realized it's not a sin to have the riches, but it is a sin to trust in those riches instead of trusting in God. Now, there's a fourth category that is not mentioned here in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23. But I want to bring this out to you because it is mentioned elsewhere in Scripture. So maybe perhaps you say, okay, I don't define my purpose in life. The end is near. What were, what were you living for? Maybe it wasn't defined in your wisdom. Maybe it wasn't defined in your strength. Maybe it wasn't defined in your riches. Great job, by the way. <laughs> Those are three good categories. But here's another category that I find is often a temptation for us to find our purpose meaning for living, our purpose in life that is other than God? Loved ones. Our family. Now, we are to love our family. We real, <laughs> husbands, love your wives, right? That's real simple. We, we ought to love our family. So God doesn't say that we are to hate in the sense that we um, reject them. Our love to God ought to be so much greater that it appears like we love him so much, it almost appears like we hate our father, mother, and brother, and sister, okay? But our love to God is so much greater, but sometimes we can make our family members and our loved ones our purpose for living, when Jesus Christ ought to be our purpose for living. If our purpose for living, if our identity is founded in our family or loved ones and not in God, when a family member moves away or dies, it seems like our identity is now lost. And sometimes people say, I find no purpose in life. 
my spouse had died, or my children had died, or my children had moved away, or my children now reject me, and the, the relationship's broken, and so I have no purpose in life, sometimes people will say. No, God should be our purpose in life. Now, we, I believe that grieving is a healthy thing. When you lose a loved one, whether it's a child or a spouse or a parent, you ought to grieve because you love them. They meant a lot to you. And we as believers ought to go through the grieving process. Yes, there's going to be a lot of adjustment in life. There's gaps that are empty now, places that they filled. There's going to be adjustments that need to be made uh, they're not here to talk to anymore. They're not here to share this uh, idea or get their opinion on. I get that, that there are adjustments, and I am not downplaying this whatsoever, okay? I believe that a believer that lost a loved one, they ought to go through the grieving process, and God will be there to comfort them. So don't misunderstand me, okay? The point I'm making is if somebody loses a loved one and they say, whether out loud or to themselves, but I, now I have no purpose in life. Maybe that's an indicator that you had the wrong purpose to begin with. Yeah, we do love that person. We do love them. We will miss them. And it'll be a long process of the healing process. But Jesus Christ ought to be the purpose in our life. Now, if you keep that marker and turn to the New Testament again, if you had in 1 Timothy, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians. So a few pages toward the front of your Bible from... 1 Timothy, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Paul the Apostle is writing to believers. This is not the lost people. He's writing to believers. And he says in verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. In other words, hey, if you don't know this, you need to know this. This is important, okay? He says, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep, the kind way of saying they're dead. They had died, okay? Once again, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now, in verse 13, he is not saying that you're not to sorrow. There is a time to laugh, there's a time to mourn, and when you lose a loved one, that's a time to mourn. I get that. That's true. That's reality. That is healthy, okay? But he's making a comparison here. My sorrow as a believer losing a loved one is not the same as a lost person that has lost a loved one. So you have this comparison. Notice that again, verse 13, that ye sorrow not even as, here's that comparison, others which have no hope. So if if we have a loved one that dies and we now say, well, I've lost my purpose in life. And I get it. People are going to be kind of uh, in between, wandering, trying to figure out how to adjust in life now with that person not there and their schedules and all these. I get that there's a time of adjustment, okay? But when all the dust settles and the grieving process is now easier to handle, if we come to the conclusion, I have no purpose for living, what a sad conclusion, Jesus is our purpose for living. He's worthy. Even Paul the Apostle said, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So turn back to Jeremiah chapter 9, if you will, in verse 24. Hopefully you kept a marker there. We saw the other sources to glory in, but we notice also God is our source to glory in. Verse 24 of Jeremiah 9. But here's a conjunction of contrast. Okay, verse 23 was what not to glory in, but here's that conjunction of contrast, but, verse 24, let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord." We find our glorying, our identity, our purpose in life, and we glory in the Lord. We glory in the fact that we can, and look again at verse 24, that we can understand and know him. 
I'll just read to you from Psalm 34, uh, just two different verses here from the Psalms. The first one in Psalm 34, listen as I read verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Psalm 44 and verse number 8 also will say, In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. Selah. Do we glory in God? Is he our purpose for living? When we realize that the end is near, as Jeremiah was warning the people of Judah and specifically the people in Jerusalem, the end is near, the Babylonians are coming. What were you living for? Your wisdom, your strength, your riches, your family? It certainly wasn't God in their eyes, according to what we read in the scriptures. And when we talk about glorying in the Lord, that we understand and know him, I'm not just saying that we believe that we know about God, but that we walk with God. You know, when you walk with somebody, generally, when you're walking with somebody, you're going in the same direction. If I was going this way and my friend was going that way, nobody would say, oh, look, they're walking together. Nobody would say that. But if we're heading in the same direction, you'd say, all right, they're walking together. So you're heading in the same direction. Generally, you're about the same speed, unless you have a big stride. Sometimes that's hard for me, right? <laughs> you have a big stride, you got to slow down. But generally, you're walking at the same speed, because if I was like 10, 15 feet in front of you, we also would say, no, you're not walking together. Maybe you're heading in the same direction. But when we walk with God, we're going in the same direction, about the same speed, maybe side by side, to the same purpose, to the same end goal. So when we talk about knowing and understanding God, we're talking about walking with God, not just knowing about God. There are many in the Christianity today that maybe know a lot of Bible stories, they know a lot of Bible facts, and they know a lot of theology, but they don't walk with God. It's not just our Bible knowledge. It's a relationship. It's a friendship. It's a fellowship. And what do I learn as I walk with God, as I glory in him? What are some things that I learn? Well, of course, there's a lot, but just a few examples are mentioned in verse 24. Notice again, it says in the middle of the verse that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. What do I learn from experience when I walk with God and glory in him? He exercises or works at, he delights in, it's pleased in three areas, briefly mentioned here in verse 24, loving kindness. He loves me and, he, and that he demonstrates that love to me in kindness, this loving kindness, this gentleness. He exercises and delights in that, but he also exercises and delights in judgment, doing what is right by you, by others, by doing what is right. Also, righteousness. So you have this uh, fairness, this equality, if you will, this general love, this acceptance. God has all this, and, and he delights in these things when we walk with him, or he delights them regardless. But I understand them, and I get to know him as I walk with him. Our glory ought to be in the Lord so that we find our identity, not in my sports, not in my hobbies, not in all these other different things, and I say, that is what I am. That's all I'm about. Um, and, you know, you can have favorite sports teams. You can have favorite hobbies and all that, and none of them in and of themselves are sinful. But if that has to define who you are, then I believe we have an idol in our lives. If we are to glory, we are to glory in the Lord. He is our constant. He is our anchor. Your sports team... They're going to they're gonna lose sometimes, right? It's inevitable. Our wisdom, we're not always going to make always the best decisions all the time. Our riches, ah, that could be taken away. Our strength, hey, that could be zapped in a moment. But God is our constant, and he's faithful and loving and kind. And so, therefore, I find my identity in him that I am his and he is mine. What a wonderful relationship and God, I can go through the time, the mountaintop experiences where I'm on top of the mountain in my life, and I can look out and see the beautiful scenery all around me. 
This is gorgeous. This is beautiful. And here's God beside me. But then also at times in my life, different seasons in my life, I'm walking through the valley and all I see is shadows. And there's a mountainside on this side and that side. I'm walking through a valley and only for that short glimmer during the day do I see the sun at all. It's all shadows. But even during that time, here is God walking beside me. During the times of darkness even, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. Isaiah 41, 13. So God, whether it's the mountaintop experiences or the valleys or somewhere in between, whether my family is with me or not, whether my riches are here, my strength, my wisdom, you are my foundation. You are my hope. You are my joy. And I glory in knowing you. And that's how we find fulfillment in life. Life doesn't end when all these things are taken away from us because my constant is in God who does not end. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are constant, immutable, unchanging, wonderful, kind, and loving. Lord, this is a pretty direct message that you've given to us as a local church. Stepped on a lot of toes, and maybe perhaps some of us have trusted in these things, wisdom, or strength, or riches, or even family, loved ones, that somehow we've allowed to come first place in our lives, and we pushed you down to second and third place. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be aware of this evil process of idolatry. Help us to be able to enjoy these other things in life, but to make sure that Jesus Christ is number one. He sits on the throne of our hearts and our purpose in life is to live for him. May the Holy Spirit of God do the work that only he can do in our hearts. We humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. As you know, at Mount Zion, we include an invitation hymn at the end of the services. Why? It's a time for us to reflect and respond upon the message that the Lord has given us. Maybe it's something you needed today and tonight. Maybe it's something you're going to need later this week. But may we respond to God as he speaks to our hearts as believers and also as a salvation invitation is open. You know, it's really sad that someday in eternity, there will be people maybe that watch live streaming, maybe were in the Mount Zion Community Church building, sometime in their life had a gospel invitation offered to them, rejected it, and died lost. How sad. So hence, we offer this opportunity again. If you're not sure of your salvation, please get it settled today. If we can help you, please let us. Let's sing.